Today's session on concurrent planning will be presented to you by Judge Sandy Miller of Paulding County. Judge Miller is the lead judge for the Paulding County Juvenile Court. She received her BS from Troy State University and her JD from Woodrow Wilson College of Law. From 1986 to 2002, Judge Miller served as a practitioner of law with Sherling and Miller. She also served as a Special Assistant Attorney General for the counties of Paulding, Polk, and Harrelson, serving the Department of Family and Children's Services and Child Support Enforcement. Judge Miller currently serves as the chair of the Paulding Children's Cabinet and the Northwest Georgia System of Care Governance Board. These organizations look at barriers and solutions to providing the best mental health care and supports for children and families. Additionally, Judge Miller and the Paulding Juvenile Court have been a part of the Georgia Court Improvement Initiative for the past four years, including the implementation of the Paulding Family Treatment Court, which is the first drug court in Paulding County. In 2002, the Paulding Juvenile Court was named to the National Model Court Project one of only 34 ma national model courts across the nation and the only one that's in our state. So it's certainly a, a huge credit to Paulding County. Judge Miller was a founding member of the Paulding Child Advocacy Center and was instrumental in the development of the Paulding Child Abuse Protocol. She's a member of the Georgia Bar Association, the Paulding Judicial Circuit Bar Association, the Georgia Alliance for Drug Endangered Children, and the National Association of Drug Court Professionals. And Judge Miller, who obviously all of those credentials stand alone, has brought with her a whole panel of co-presenters co on this topic. So if you'll bear with me, we'll go through each uh, introductions for each. And I'll ask that you maybe raise your hand so everyone knows which, who we're referring to, because I'll just go in order. Angie Chandler with Paulding County DFAC's Permanency Supervisor. Angie has worked with the Community Service Board as a case manager working with adults and families impacted by mental health issues from 1992 to 2000. In 2000, she joined DFACS in the Investigations Unit. She then worked with the Diversion Program and ultimately started supervising this program. Angie has been supervising for the past six years, with the last three years supervising permanency. She is also an adoptive parent to a child who was formerly in foster care. So she speaks it personally and professionally. Barbara Burn Burnley, Paulding County DFACS County Director. Barbara began working with DFACS in 1983 and has worked in various programs, including investigations, permanency, which was formerly foster care, resource development, and the adoption unit. She became a supervisor in 1994 and has supervised all of those units as well, permanency, adoptions, and child protective services. Barbara became the services administrator and has held that position for four years until becoming the county director three years ago. Turning to the remaining panelists, um, Amy Mobley, to my left, has worked with the Division of Family and Children's Services for 17 years. She worked 11 years in foster care, child protective services, and a county training coordinator, and six years in education and training for the Professional Excellence Program. And to her left is Julie York. Julie York is a project director for education and training services section for the Division of Family and Children's Services. Uh, ETS, that training section, is responsible for training all child welfare services staff and Office of Family Independent staff statewide. Ms. York has worked for DFACS for nine years, and before her work there, she worked for Maternal and Child Health nonprofit organization for five years in Atlanta. Julie earned her bachelor's degree in social work from Auburn University and her master's degree in social work from the University of Georgia. So once again, we tried to deliver some really well-qualified um, professionals and experts in this field to talk to you today. And I hope that you'll join me in welcoming our visiting scholars in practice to present to you today about concurrent planning. Thank you. Let me first apologize that it is, uh, this is a Friday afternoon at um, almost 1.30. Everybody says that I'm the one that picked the time and date, but I don't remember doing that, but they said I did. So I apologize that we're here on a Friday afternoon. Um, I want to thank, um, thank you for allowing us to come and, and participate in this um, particular process and to talk to you about concurrent planning, something that you'll see in a few minutes that we are all very passionate about. I want to also give a special thanks to, um, to all of the team members after I got drafted into this, I drafted all of them, and they've not been very kind to me this week about <laughs> what I got them into. I also want to thank the Justice for Children, and uh, in particular Christopher Church, who is always willing to help us out and um, give us guidance as we need it. Now, the reason we brought a team with us today is because we really do take the approach that it is a village approach in order to care for children. And so this is part of the village right here. They've come with me. Uh, we each uh, play a part in protecting children and when they, when they come into foster care, but more importantly, we have an obligation, a duty, 
a responsibility to get those children out of foster care. It's easy to get into foster care. It's harder to get out. And we're going to talk about um, one of the ways that we can help children get out of foster care in the right way. Let me tell you why I decided to um, talk about uh, concurrent planning and why I got on a mission to look into it. I was uh, on the bench and I had a, bless her heart, she was a new case manager. But I asked her um, after she had given me a lengthy uh, dissertation about all of the reunification efforts that were being made, and this was a concurrent plan, and it called for a reunification and adoption, and I said to her, and so tell me what you're doing on the adoption side. And bless her heart, she looked like a deer in headlights and said, oh, we don't start anything on the adoption side until TPR is completed. I thought, okay, well, that's interesting. So then in, uh, another day or two later, I had another case manager that came in front of me, and this was a, another concurrent case plan, and it was concurrent reunification and live with a fit and willing relative. Well, we had just done the case review. I review my cases every three months. We had just done the, the review and we had gone over the diligent search for relatives and I thought I heard her say that they, she, hadn't, she had not yet identified any relatives. So I said, well now, how can this be a plan to place this child with a relative when in fact there are no relatives? And again, she had the deer in the headlight look and I said, so this was just wishful thinking. Is that right? And basically, that's right. The case needed to be concurrent, so they pulled something out of the air and um, made it concurrent. So I got on the internet and I googled concurrent planning, and I came up with uh, Amy and Julie, who are part of the training staff in, for the state of Georgia, and they have already developed a thorough training packet for concurrent planning. And so we all put our heads together, my um, county uh, director and the case manager supervisor. We started making changes immediately. Now our case managers come to court and they tell me what they're doing on the concurrent side of the case plan. But y'all, there's a lot to know about it. This isn't just something you can, um, can uh, throw in place. There's really um, almost a science behind it, but we'll debate science and art in a few minutes. So we, are, we have done our research now on the best practices for implementing concurrent case plans, and now we are ready to go. So let's talk about our vision for today. Um, basically, there are three things that we want to share with you and we want you to take away from this presentation. First thing is we want, to, want you to understand the theory behind concurrent case planning, because it is a theory. It's not just a name. When we were um, putting this uh, package to, presentation together, I wanted to call this concurrent 101 dash why are we call it concurrent planning when all we're doing is working the reunification side of the plan? Because that's what a lot of folks in the, um, throughout the state of Georgia are doing. They are putting on that case plan, this is a concurrent case plan, calls for reunification and something else, but we're not working the something else. Um, so we want to talk to you about the theory behind how you develop a concurrent case plan and what are the best practices. The other thing we want to do is we want you to understand that the practice that will promote good concurrent case planning, it's not just something on paper. There's a lot of thought that goes behind, goes into concurrent planning. There's a lot of um, processes and practices that go into this. And when Julie and Amy get up here, they're gonna really talk about some of the um, practical solutions that have put in place. And let's see, what was the third one? I'm trying not to look. I'm trying to see if I can remember it on my own. There was a third one. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Y'all have been watching the presidential debates, right? <laughs> okay. Third one is we want you to understand what, where Georgia is today and, re, and with respect to current planning and where we need to go. I can tell you exactly where we are. We are not where we need to be, and, but we'll tell you where we're going to go in a little bit. So hang on and we'll get there. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about foundational matters and also about concurrent planning nationally. And then um, Julie and Amy are going to talk about uh, concurrent planning in Georgia. Uh, Barbara and Angie are going to talk about trials and tribulations at the county level. And then we're going to um, have questions. And so if you raise your hand during the course of the presentation, I'm going to stick up this little yellow sticker. And that reminds you to write it down and uh, ask a question. So let's get started. All right, concurrent current planning. Working towards reunification while at the same time establishing and implementing an alternative permanency plan. Now there are two key words highlighted in this particular sentence. 
but there are two other words that are even more important. And the two most important words in that sentence is they are same time. That's what we forget about concurrent planning. It means doing it at the same time. We're working reunification, we're looking at an alternative placement, but we're doing them at the same time. We are not working reunification until it doesn't work anymore, and then we're starting the alternative permanency plan. We're doing them at the same time. All right, um, the concurrent planning is supposed to be an innovative planning for foster uh, care children, and it's a management tool that the case managers can use but it's not just a, a checkoff list, it's more, important, it's more detailed than that. And a lot of case managers don't get that same time concept. Let me tell you, I've, I've told them before, I couldn't be a case manager, I really couldn't. There's just too much work involved and I, I really feel for them. But this truly is, if it's gonna be concurrent, you have got to run two tracks. You can't just call it that. And I want them to do it in the, the best manner that they can. So. Let's look at the types of permanency plans that we have. We know we've got reunification. We know we've got alternative plans. We've got adoption, legal guardianship, and then permanent custody with a fit and willing relatives. And then we've got the word I don't even like to say, APLA. I do not like that word. But let me tell you, this slide doesn't, doesn't say it, but APLA, um, in order to put a child in a, another plan living arrangement, you have to give the court a compelling reason for placing the child in that particular permanency track. And I have a good friend that says that there exists no valid compelling reason for choosing APLA as a permanency plan. And in the summer, this past summer, summer of 2011, as part of our national model court um, work that we did. We had someone from the national office to come out. We had someone from our Justice for Children to come out. We had our stakeholders at the meeting and we all together as a group decided we are not going to put another child in an APLA situation. It does not exist in Paulding County anymore. Because if we're after permanency for children, homelessness is not a plan. That is not a permanency plan. That's homelessness. And did, do you know, by any chance, do, do you know that this month, November, is National Youth Homeless Awareness Month? APLA. Shouldn't use it? Never. There's never a reason to use APLA. Just, you know, a little something, food for thought. So, all right, let's talk about children that, um, that do get the APLA brand on their head, their forehead. Um, they're gonna age out of foster care into homelessness. And then as of, let's go over our, um, our stats here. As of October 1st of 2011, we had 2,902 children in foster care with concurrent case plans in the state of Georgia. And that was about 40% of the uh, overall population in care. Obviously, the, the most common primary plan is reunification, but then we have the um, other primary plans, such as APLA and relatives and adoption. And you see what the breakdown is. 52 kids had been stamped with APLA, and basically, to me, that's just like being given a life sentence. Okay, you're APLA, you're gonna age out. And do you know that, go to the next slide meeting age six, but do you know that, look at this, at age one, APLA, I mean, what if that was an APLA kid? And in fact, there was a case, um, if you all uh, keep up with the case law, there was a case out of um, Fulton County a couple of weeks ago where um, the judge put a child in uh, temporary guardianship at age two. Surely there's somebody that will adopt a two-year-old. Surely there is, and I believe that the guardian ad litem then uh, appealed it. But when I was looking at some of the research, I, I really did, I saw a four-year-old child with an APLA case plan, another planned living arrangement. Four-year-old children can be adopted. Somebody out there can, um, can serve as a, 
a good parent to them. Now we know that um, if you'll go back, if you'll back up to the, all right, so make sure I got all of that. So children from four to 18 are included in this, um, this list of uh, data. And one of the things that um, this particular Barton Clinic has done with these uh, presentations is they have done a particular session on permanency counseling. And I don't know the, exactly who it was, but the, her name, oh, it's Marjorie Musgrave. Marjorie Musgrave did a presentation. Is that right, Melissa, do you know? Okay, so if you've got a child who says, I don't want to be adopted, what you need to do is you need to make sure that they are put in touch with someone that can ca counsel them. A case manager shouldn't just stop there. If, if you've got a teenager that says, I don't want to be adopted, just need a little bit of work. Just need to approach it a different way. So I think every child can, um, can be adopted, most every child. So I, we believe that if this state were to implement concurrent planning correctly the way it should be, that we would no longer have any child in APLA and that children will stop aging out of foster care in the state of Georgia. Now that's a pretty big goal, but that's what we're going to try to do. And now let's go back to, let's go forward in the median age. Look at all these children right here with concurrent plannings. Look at all the opportunities for permanent homes for, for these children. That's a great opportunity and it's, um, it's one that we should take hold of and make sure that these children get a true permanent um, home out of them. All right, next, let's go to benefits of concurrent planning. This is what we're hoping will come out of, of concurrent planning. In a few minutes, you're actually going to know what the theory and the, and the process is and some of the um, tools that are available to guide case managers with concurrent planning. What we're hoping the benefits are is that, number one, there'll be fewer placements for children in care. Because if you actually put a child in a placement um, in the beginning and you decide that this particular family or this particular child that we're a, a concurrent reunification plan is the way to go then you're going to start working with the foster family the resource family and you're going to make a decision about where this child is going to be placed early on now you you know that's what we're supposed to be doing anyway but we don't always do that but if you go to a true concurrent planning process that should happen automatically we're going to have fewer adoption disruptions let me tell you, of all the cases that I have to hear, adoption disruptions are the saddest, the most difficult. You have a child who has already been tormented, been traumatized by his parents, traumatized in foster care, goes to an adoptive home, and although that should be their forever home, when it disrupts, that's the third disruption for this child. This, this child is traumatized, truly. We're hoping that with concurrent planning, we'll be able to reduce the length of time in care. I've got a, um, we've got a good slide in a few minutes. It's going to show you about some information related to that. And one of the really new benefits of concurrent planning is that we're going to be able to form new extended families. We're going to talk about how, you know, in the old days, foster care, well, in the old days, it's still that. We're still in the old days. You put a child in foster care, and the foster family and the foster and the, and the, the natural parents, they don't talk. In fact, we try to keep them apart at, at, at all cost. And uh, what we're going to be doing with concurrent case planning is, is turning that around a little bit and uh, it's forming new extended families with the um, resource family, the foster parent. And then, of course, supports con it, uh, the concurrent planning supports continuity and stability in family relationships. And I'll talk a little more about that in a minute. And if we do all of that, we are certainly going to produce some cost savings, and we could all use some cost savings because you know, we're running out of money. All right, let's go into the theory of a concurrent planning. The first issue is reducing the time in foster care. Right now in the state of Georgia, case managers try to rehabilitate. And then, if those efforts don't work, then if they're unsuccessful, they introduce the alternative permanency plans. This usually leaves a child in the care for 12 to 18 months with a reunification plan before the alternative plan is even begun. 12 to 18 months in care without knowing what other permanency plan they're gonna have. So when reunification doesn't work, this child now has to go, you know, uh, six, 12, 18 more months with a new plan. This is what we call sequential planning. 
this is what we're doing in the state of Georgia. We are marking our case plans and we are calling it concurrent planning, but we are truly doing sequential planning. And um, basically the, sequ the sequential model, it, um, it's two tracks, it's services aimed at reunification, and then when that doesn't work, then we move to the, um, and we're always looking at the deficits of the birth parents and what it is we think we can help. And when that doesn't work, then we go, okay, well, let's do something, something else for, for these folks. Let's um, try something different. And uh, who, of course, is the beneficiary of waiting all that length of time and parents not working their case plan is, of course, the children. <clears throat> the other thing that, um, the other theory behind concurrent planning is that we're gonna shift the emotional burden off the children to the adults. I love this part. Little children who have been placed in foster care are traumatized. They're safer than they were at home, but it's traumatic. Uh, and you know, any child who, a parent can do just about anything harmful that, that you could name, and a child is still gonna love his mama and his daddy. There have been very few cases where there's been sufficient trauma that p the children didn't wanna have contact with their parents. There have been a few, but not very many. So let's take the burden off of the children. Let's put it on the parents where it belongs. What we want to do is um, have the children, rather than have the children um, assume the emotional risk of foster care, we want the adults to manage the, the ambiguity of the relationship, you know, um, because foster children are torn. You know, who do I call mama? Who do I, who, you know, who's my daddy? Um, who do I love? Is it okay to love my foster parents? Well, if I love my foster parents, does that mean I don't love my mom and daddy? It's just, it's, it's truly, it's um, traumatic. So we want the um, parents and the foster parents, the resource parents, to take on some of this ownership of the emotional part. Right now, what we're trying to do with foster parents is we're encouraging them to, and empowering them to treat their foster parent children as their own. You know, treat them like they are your children. And you know, so then the foster kids start calling them mom and dad, and that's just all really confusing. Then they go off to visit, and they call somebody else mom and dad. It's just, it's, it's hard. Um, while the bond between the children and the foster parents was, is strengthening in a reunification case plan, it is obvious that the bond between the foster child and the natural parents is being damaged or weakened. And although these things are well-intentioned, the emotional disconnect for the children um, is damaging to the children and to the, to the parents. Um, basically, what we have when children are in foster care is parents, their parenting abilities are limited to the time in which the children are visiting with them. That's the only time they really can show off their parenting skills or lack of parenting skills is during those, um, those scheduled visits. And sometimes the um, Foster parents get to sign a, a form saying, well, yeah, well, we can go out of, the children can go out of state. And other than that, there's just not a whole lot of um, parenting responsibility on the foster, on, excuse me, on the biological parents while the child is in foster care. So the old track system, it's sort of like having a parent and a child going to the same place, reunification, but on different trains. So we've got two trains going down the track and, um, Think about it if you were on one of these, um, one of these railroad cars. You're, you're part of a group traveling to the same destination, but you're on separate trains running on parallel tracks. So you have no opportunity to communicate with the rest of your party except during stops or breaks, visits. And um, your group's interaction is really strictly limited to a brief encounter or an interlude at rest stops. What would your relationship with your group look like if this went on for 12 to 15 months? What if that was your journey? 12 to 15 months, and the only have time you have contact is um, occasional visits. The child, and relationship, the child relationship and the connectedness suffers as a result of being on these two tracks during the entire 12 to 15 month journey. And that's not, that's not acceptable. We're not going to allow it to happen. And then the bad part is that um, when you finally get to the same destination, if it is reunification, then the children have to reestablish a bond with their parents. So if we went 12 to 18 months, very little contact 
with parents other than at visitation, but it's a reunification case plan concurrent with something else. We work the reunification plan and we finally get the child and the parent back together. Then we've got additional time where the child is still um, has this emotional disconnect to the parents and that has to be fixed. So if you'll remember the definition of concurrent planning, it means providing family reunification efforts while simultaneously, same time, developing a permanent parenting plan for the child. And concurrent planning exemplifies the best practice. It's, um, the values are based on the child being child-focused, family-centered, and culturally competent. And of those of you that um, deal with mental health issues, we hear those terms all the time. If you're gonna write a grant for something, you've got to make sure that your program is based on uh, it's child focused it's family centered and culturally competent and we believe uh, concurrent planning is in fact that so what exactly do we want to happen what we want to do what i want to do is i want to start looking at how and why a case manager makes a decision to develop a case a concurrent case plan and what she what she's used to make that decision because you can't make that in a vacuum then what we need to be doing is following some national best practices that will move us forward in finalizing the statewide training that we've already got developed and just needs to be spread out across the, the state. We wanna train all the case managers, but we don't wanna just send them to a, a classroom like this and say, okay, now here's the training for concurrent planning. You're gonna do this, 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 and this now. Go and do it. This is so serious, what we need to have is someone from the training office to come and actually work with case managers to help them make these decisions. Um, and that's the only way a person is really gonna get trained accurately in um, concurrent planning. And you know, case managers are overwhelmed. Um, do we have any case managers in here? Just, no, okay. Well, I'll just tell you, case managers are overwhelmed and we don't want them to say, oh my gosh, if somebody talked about concurrent planning, when that, come down, when that comes down the pike, we're gonna have all of this work to do. No, this is just good social work, just plain old social work 101. Everybody should be doing this um, and making these decisions every single time there's a, a family in, uh, in foster care. So we want the case managers to become familiar with the principles and we want the guardian ad litems, parent attorneys, the SAGs, the special assistant attorney generals to be familiar with the total process and understand the process and not just say the words concurrent planning. I can tell you this, when I was a SAG for Paulding, and Harrelson and Polk. That was back in the day when we had 150 kids in care. And um, boy, when they told me they wanted to plan to be concurrent, I thought, oh yeah, yeah. That just means I'm gonna have to work a little harder because now y'all gonna throw that word out there and it's gonna be um, adoption and the parents aren't gonna consent to anything from this point forward because now they think you wanna have their children adopted right out from under them. You're gonna make my job harder. I hated that word, I hated concurrent. But back then we did the same thing. We called it concurrent, but we were still working a sequential plan, so. All right, now let's talk about some, um, some of the current practices that the national level has. The, um, let me tell you how we got into sequential planning. This is how it started. Back in 1980, uh, with the Adoption Assistance Act and, and Child, Fair, Child Welfare Act, uh, it was preferred that you develop a permanency plan and then rule it out before you move down the line to another permanency plan. So that's how we got sequential planning. And that's what, how we got foster care drift. Children were staying in foster care because you, give, you gave a family a year to work their plan and they didn't, but they worked a few things. Well, then let's give them another year. And then they worked a few more things. Well, they're really close, so let's give them another year. When I, became, when I took over as a SAG in whatever year, a long, long time ago, children had been in care for five and six and seven years. And that was the norm. Well, that's not the norm anymore, at least not in Paulding County. And I hope it's not the norm across the state because that's not the way you, that's not the way you do things. But I had that same mentality, SAG. Oh, don't call me, don't, don't say concurrent. Please don't call it concurrent. All right, so then in 1997, the courts, the, um, the uh, Adoption Saves Family Act allowed the courts to order concurrent planning. 1997, really? And we still don't know how to implement concurrent case plan? Okay, we got some catching up to do. We got some serious catching up to do. 1997, we have had concurrent case plans 
and we've yet to um, get it right. All right, now let's talk about the impact that calling something concurrent has on folks. It sort of ruffles feathers, courts and attorneys. You know, I've been listening to case plans for 10 years, and there are a thousand things that you can ask a case manager, a thousand things. So I decided, I just asked about this concurrent planning, but not every judge out there is asking about it. So it's gonna take training judges, and no, tr judges don't like training. Well, we do, we have fun when we go to, for training. But, um, yeah, this is gonna be a new concept. Oh my gosh, we're changing things, oh, oh, anyway. But attorneys, they're gonna be the same way. Oh, you can't, I've got one of my parent attorneys right here. You can't call this adoption. We've only been at this for six months. You can't go to a concurrent case plan and call this adoption. These parents haven't even had a chance to work their case plan. I can hear it now. That's okay, when we get it right, when we do it the right way, you're gonna love it. <laughs> All right, then the provider community. Do you know that some of the providers with the state, you cannot begin an action with that provider until the TPR is filed? It's not the way to do business. Local case managers, um, they don't want the tension. Once you say adoption, you know, you just lost your best bud. Uh, the case managers and the parents are not going to get along once you throw the word adoption out there unless you do it the right way. And then, of course, foster parents and the relatives, asking them to sign up for the role of Plan B. Well, we're going to talk more about Plan B, of these alternative plans. Uh, foster parents, some of them have their own agenda. Many of them are there strictly for the children. And when Barbara and Angie get up, you're going to hear about some of our wonderful foster parents in our county, some of our few little foster parents that can handle this. Not all foster parents can handle knowing that a child is coming into your home, that you're going to be working a concurrent case plan, and they might not be able to have this child because reunification is going to work out. And they're going to work with the parent to make sure reunification works out. That's sort of working against their own, that's a conflict of interest is what we would call that. So that's gonna be interesting to see how that works out. Now, let me just show you what's happened. Once the feds, you know, back in 1997, the feds said we're gonna do concurrent planning. And so now, the, uh, now they're recognizing, oops, we got problems. They're not implemented on a consistent basis when appropriate. Some states have formal, excellent concurrent plan policies but it doesn't filter down to the, st to the local level and there's no evidence of true concurrent planning. And in a number of states, Georgia, concurrent goals were written in the case files, but case reviews showed the efforts toward the goals were sequential rather than concurrent. And that's where we still are. All right, and research on non-reunification. Uh, this is funny, this little baby, I've, we've been working on this presentation for a while. I feel just like this little baby. Um, the, the more I think about things, the more confused I get. And um, so we've had all of our emphasis on uh, researching of non-reunification. You know, here are all the, the exceptions to when you can uh, have a non-reunification case plan. All of these factors are, are laid out for us by the statute. These are the easy cases. This is the easy ones you know. Okay, these we can rule out. We don't even have to think about uh, concurrent planning. But one of the concepts that we're going to be looking at with concurrent planning is that we're going to let case managers assess the likelihood of the family to be reunited. And they're going to have a, a guide. It's sort of like a checklist, but, not, but it's a little more extensive. It's not just check it off and, and boom, it's a concurrent plan. It's really to think through the process. And those that are likely to reunify we can make it concurrent because what if they don't pass it and get the case plan worked? Even though you think they might, what if they don't? So we're gonna make it concurrent. But these, um, the um, indicators right here, like I said, they're the easy ones and they're the exceptions to making reasonable efforts. So the point is, is that nothing is black and white you can't just look at a family and say, this is a family where we should have concurrent planning. You can't just make everybody a concurrent plan. There are truly factors that go into the thinking process to determine 
when you should use concurrent planning and when you should not use concurrent planning. Like I say, these are the easy cases, but we can't let case managers think these are the only things that we can, uh, can eliminate. So we have to keep moving with that. And this is really, it's, you can't reduce this to a science. You can't have it on a checklist. You can't say this, you know, this family meets this, this, and this. Therefore, we can do concurrent planning or we cannot do concurrent planning. So it's going to be a process. It's going to be a case manager along with a case manager supervisor, probably along with maybe the director. The director may not want to get that involved, but it's a process. It's not just a everybody gets one. And um, Julie and Amy are going to share us a lot, share a lot of information about that. Now, let me just show you some data. We, we like to say we love data, but let me tell you, data makes us better people. If you're looking right here on the um, discharge for reunification, look at that. Reunification, they come in, we start reuniting. Look at this over here. Children come into foster care, 12 months. This is adoption, 12 months, nothing, nothing happens. Oop, we got a little bit of blurb right here. So we're at uh, 12 through 15 months, let's see, 17, 18, 20, almost, so we still haven't gotten to 24. So from zero to right here at 24, you can tell we're not working adoption like we ought to. We got a flat line over here on adoption where we're, we're, we're able to re reunify right at the front but then when we talk about a child that's truly going to be an adoption case where we know that parents are not going to work the reunification case plan, by golly, we, can, we got the data to support it. So we do nothing on the adoption side for the first 12 months. That's not the way it's supposed to be. Let me, let me show you what's going on in Jacksonville. The um, screen over here, of course, is reunification, similar to Georgia. Uh, if children come into foster care, we start working reunification, getting them out. But look what they do in adoption. Children come into foster care, concurrent case plans are developed, and we start working the plan, and we're getting them adopted before the 12 month mark. That's the way it ought to be. That's the way it ought to be. And so if you really follow the, the theory, the practice, the science, the art of concurrent planning, then you are changing the outcomes, the permanency outcomes for children in a, a much faster timeline. All right, so we're gonna take a break right here and we've been at it almost an hour, not quite. Uh, so we're gonna take a break and then we will uh, finish up with Julie and Amy and Barbara and Angie and they're gonna be talking about how to implement concurrent planning. So thank you. I'll turn it back over to Julie and Amy, who will pick up at this segment. All right, so uh, Judge Miller talked uh, a lot about concurrent planning and some of the national picture and perspective. So you guys may be wondering, why aren't we doing this in Georgia? Why are we still doing sequential plans? Because Judge Miller made such a good case um, for using concurrent plans for providing for, uh, as a tool to help provide for permanency for children. Um, and you might be wondering what all it entails. Um, so that's what Amy and I are gonna talk about and a little bit about the perspective of where we are in Georgia currently. Um, Amy and I worked with a concurrent planning expert um, over the past couple of years and she um, has a quote that we love to say and uh, concurrent planning isn't rocket science, it's harder. Um, and it truly is because you're talking about an art and a science and also about dealing with children's lives and also parents who may be on board or not. So um, that's where I'm gonna pick up. Um, so what all is involved in concurrent planning and how does it take shape? Um, Judge Miller mentioned the assessment piece. Um, there is uh, an assessment tool that we've developed for Georgia um, that looks at, uh, it's a prognostic assessment, assessing uh, a family's history and whether reunification is likely or not in a family. Um, the assessment assists case managers in identifying family strengths, whatever needs the family may have, and whatever core problems exist. 
uh, the assessment allows case managers to kind of hypothesize about um, the probability of the child being reunified and also about um, the need for an alternative permanency plan. The idea behind the assessment is, is that if um, parents have a poor prognosis of reunification, then there is a need for an alternative permanency plan and concurrent planning would be appropriate. So um, when we conduct, when a case manager conducts the uh, assessment. It helps the family also understand what it's going to take for them to reunify and it also puts a, a demand on the agency for the agency to provide intensive reunification services so that can occur. But it also allows for um, the agency and ultimately the child to move to permanency quicker because if those reunification services don't work out, if a parent um, for some reason of or another decides that they don't want um, their child back or they're not able to resolve whatever core problems occur, then we're already set up to move directly towards adoption or the other uh, alternative permanency plan so the child can move to permanency quicker and we can follow our guidelines. Um, the tool is just an assessment tool. It's not a um, well, this many checks, and yes, we're going to do concurrent planning. Um, it's just a tool to assist case managers in assessing, uh, but other considerations case managers need to take is, you know, we have family team meetings where we engage parents in honest conversations about where they are, what their core problems are, what kind of support systems they have. So we use the family team meeting as a time to engage parents. Um, we also have other assessments, the comprehensive child and family assessment, um, we use collateral contacts with um, other folks in the community who know the family, service providers, school system, doctors, um, interviews with the family, staffings, all of this information kind of helps uh, determine if the uh, situation or if the child is appropriate for a concurrent plan. So again, you can see it's not rocket science, it's a little bit harder, you know, you're dealing with all these different elements. And they also, you have, you should have a copy of the assessment guide in your handouts. Um, like we said, that's just one, it's, um, it's a one pager, and it's just one guide that you would use, one of the many guides you would use when you're um, looking for the, to assess the family. Do y'all, okay, it looks like you have the county planning handout. Maybe we can get them the, oh, um, Melissa's telling me we're going to post it online so okay. you guys can have it. Great. Um, so the next component is family engagement, full disclosure of whatever strengths, needs, and indicators for um, concurrent planning exist and consequences. And this is, is, again, a difficult subject for case managers to have to uh, talk with birth parents about. Um, families, we, we need to provide families with clarity regarding legal requirements and the permanency timeline we have um, according to ASFA. Um, timelines designated by the law and whatever the crisis is that is occurring that's requiring placement um, can possibly serve as motivators to motivate parents to remedy the situation and uh, reuni reunify with their children. Um, time limits are supposed to be explained to birth parents as a part of full disclosure. Um, you know, uh, Judge Miller was mentioning practice from years ago, and I'm not sure how upfront we used to be to, with parents. Um, I doubt we were very upfront with parents about what timelines they face um, and what timelines we face, but that's something we encourage case managers to be upfront about. Um, you know, what this process entails and what the timelines are and what's going to occur and what the consequences are. Um, families need to understand the timetables also because Judge Miller has also said several times any placement outside of a birth family is traumatic to a child. I can't even imagine, um, you know, my nine-year-old going to another family and what that would do to her. And parents need to understand that. Um, there's a lot of research behind that. Um, and any move is a traumatic move for a child. So um, parents need to understand that as well. Um, diligent search, it's early and ongoing aggressive search of relatives. 
um, looking at both sides of parents. Um, traditionally, we've focused on maternal uh, relatives, and we need to know who the daddy is and who his family is. Those are options as well. Um, often case managers tend to kind of wait to see who's coming out of the woodworks. Who's going to take care of this child? Do I have a taker? Do I have a taker? Not really assessing is that a viable option. One example we give is, um, you know, uh, an 82-year-old grandmother taking care of a one-year-old. Is that a real viable permanent solution? Um, <coughs> maybe, maybe not. It just depends, and that's something that case managers need to look at instead of just the first relative that comes forward. Um, usually, we do a good job of looking for relatives within the first 30 days, and we kind of just see what we have. Um, but um, we're trying to emphasize ongoing, aggressive, diligent search efforts so that you can find the most viable option for a permanency plan for a child who may or may not reunify with their parents. Um, firm timelines for permanency. Um, next slide, I think. Um, we always have to continually assess where we are in the process with birth parents. Um, as far as them uh, resolving whatever issues occurred. Um, we <coughs> emphasize reviewing case plans every three months. Judge Miller says she does that in her practice. Um, at the ninth month period, um, that's when we really need to assess. I mean, we're doing this all along, but we need to assess if the birth parent isn't making progress and let them know, okay, we're in the ninth month, the twelfth month is coming. We um, have been working that other plan, but we're really going to look at that other plan now um, because of whatever circumstances that you're not able to uh, finish your case plan and resolve those issues that brought the child into care in the first place. Um, if the birth parent's making progress, we just continue to monitor and support. Um, the whole goal is to have the child in a permanent placement, whether either reunification or adoption or those other uh, permanency options by the 12th month so we can follow our uh, federally required guidelines. Um, I talked a little bit about full disclosure to parents. You might be saying, what is that? Um, and which parents are you talking about? Are you talking about foster resource parents? Or are you talking about birth parents? I'm talking about both. Um, and it's a very hard conversation to have, but um, in the research that we've done and looking at other states who really do a good job with concurrent planning, um, it is a difficult conversation. But in being honest with birth parents, I think case managers have experienced being able to resolve those cases a whole lot quicker. Um, sometimes parents say, I cannot parent this child anymore. That is okay. Um, that actually helps us get towards a permanency plan quicker if they say, you know, I can't do this anymore. It's almost easier than a parent who just does the bare minimum to keep the plan going. Um, so we just, we need to be honest with uh, birth parents uh, regarding their rights and responsibilities, what services the agency is required to provide in order to reunify the family, uh, permanency and parenting options, as well as consequences for not following the plan. Um, so uh, some other things we want to talk about. Uh, birth parents, we want to let them know is we want to let them know the agency's roles and responsibilities to the child and, and those time frames. Also, they need to know uh, what caused the placement um, in their opinion, but also um, the official placement cause on the agency side as well. Um, they need to know what resources are available to assist them. They also, again, need to know that placement is traumatic for a child. Um, and children still need to be connected with their families. Um, Judge Miller also mentioned the visitation issue. Um, I'm going to go ahead and talk about that next. Um, traditionally, the agency defects has just said, all right, we're going to do one visit a week, twice a month, um, with no rhyme or reason as to why that frequency. Um, research shows that uh, those decisions regarding visitation really need to be made on based on the age of the child and any needs that the child has. 
Um, for you all who are parents, if you have a newborn, could you imagine what kind of parental bond you would have if you saw that newborn once a month? You're not going to have one. Um, you know, toddlers need daily interaction with their birth parents, and this is, you know, the visitation schedule is not meant to be a punishment or you can't see your children only at this time. It's just meant to provide structure. Um, that visitation schedule is, or the visitation is crucial to providing uh, efforts to be made for reunification services and it really does need to be based on the age of the child. Um, the resource parents also need to know what is going on, the foster parents. Um, they need to know um, a thorough description of the child, the circumstances, um, background information, why the child is appropriate for concurrent planning. This is when you have to re-emphasize to resource parents, foster parents, that there's no guarantee that the child is going to remain with them. Um, despite what any initial assessment says. Um, the other thing is, is we expect um, our resource parents, our foster parents, to really work with those birth parents, set a good example, serve as a mentor. Um, when visitation is occurring, you know, they can get together and take children to uh, doctor's appointments together. If there's an issue that has come up at school, there's no reason why birth parents and foster parents can't work together to resolve it. Um, foster care is not a vacation for a birth parent. The birth parents still need to be involved and I think um, as an agency we've been hesitant to bring foster parents and birth parents together. Um, a lot of our really good foster parents want to be involved with birth parents and want to help them out and mentor and serve as a, as, as a coach in parenting. So with full disclosure, parents ultimately decide the outcome of the case. They're the ones in control. Um, they have the right to know the permanency timeline. They can handle the truth. Might be an initial shock at first, but they can handle um, what's going on with their particular uh, case and what needs to happen for reunification to occur. Um, and I believe there is a handout in your, um, in your packet regarding full disclosure. So. Um, can we go back? Oh, no problem. So um, we talked about um, diligent search early and ongoing exploration of family members as caretakers. Again, it's just a critical part of concurrent planning. Um, early paternity determination. Also, again, I <coughs> talked a little bit ago about us doing a really good job of finding maternal relatives, but we also need to know who the father is and what supports he can provide and who paternal relatives are as well. Um, I think I've covered the visitation issue. Um, parents who, research shows us that parents who visit their children regularly have the best chance of reunification. The more structured the visitation plans, the more likely the parents will participate. So no loosey-goosey, you know, we need to make sure it's very structured. Um, failure to prefer defects to provide for meaningful visits between children in foster care and their parents. Um, may constitute a failure on the agency's part to make reasonable efforts for reuni reunification and it will affect finalization of a permanency plan. Um, another thing we need to also be looking at is parental ambivalence. Those are those folks who do just the bare minimum to keep the case going. Um, that needs to be addressed and confronted up front because um, that that also contributes to that uh, foster care drift where kids are just going to linger. Um, I imagine it would be difficult as a judge to make a decision if a parent is participating somewhat um, for TPR. Um, but, you know, we also have to emphasize to parents that your child is still lingering and doesn't have a permanent, uh, a permanent home and we need to make sure that that permanency occurs. All right, we can, we can move on. Um, the uh, concurrent planning assessment um, just looks at, um, I think we've talked about this already, it's just an assessment um, of likelihood of being reunified and uh, parents with the poor prognosis are given a concurrent plan and 
we disclose fully that they have a concurrent plan. Can go to the next one. Okay, so um, how, how are we doing in Georgia, or, or what are we doing in Georgia? Um, many of you may know, I think uh, Barton actually has a webinar on this on their website about the Child and Family Services Review. This is a requirement from the federal government if you receive child welfare funding. We have to uh, look at our outcomes and report those to the federal government every seven years. Um, we had a review back in 2006. It was reported in 07. And they told us we were doing not so good on concurrent planning. A part of that review, um, the state um, implemented a uh, program improvement plan. And some of the deliverables on that pro program improvement plan was to uh, up our ante in concurrent planning practice, train staff, um, you know, have some technical assistance from one of their national resource centers around it and just get our practice a little more defined and, and, and started in Georgia. So we had six innovation zones in Georgia, um, Catoosa, Fulton County, Brantley County, Muskogee, Richmond, and Walton counties. They're on the map there, where we did um, intensive training, technical assistance um, to provide some guidance with concurrent planning. You can go ahead. And, that, and that's kind of where we have stopped with that initiative. Um, we really, um, as, as Judge Miller talked about earlier too, it's very um, intensive for concurrent planning services. Our case managers are very overwhelmed. It takes a lot of resources. Um, I know that uh, working with Judge Miller and the staff in Paulding County has kind of reinvigorated us into working with concurrent planning more and getting staff trained. And I know uh, Judge Miller has some plans for us in the very near future. Um, to uh, really put this practice back out there. I'm going to let Amy talk. Okay. Um, with concurrent planning, we have, working with the innovation zones, the, the state of Georgia you just saw, and the individual counties, with concurrent planning, you have to do a lot of prep work prior to going in. And one of those is um, how we recruit foster parents and how we um, change the message um, when we how we serve foster children the, the message currently and in the past is um, we're doing it for the child we just focus on the child they come from these terrible homes we got to save them um, you know that they cannot go back you know sometimes we, we we see that when we're working with families but our message is now not just focusing on the child but partnering with the family so we have revised, or we're currently revising the, the impact training, which is the training to train foster parents. And in that training, we are recruiting parents, foster parents, that can um, be partnership parents, which is just considered a regular foster home where you'll work with the child and the birth parent. Or you'll be a resource parent, which is where you're designated as a concurrent planning home. And these homes are reserved for con pl concurrent planning cases only. Now, in the six innovation zones, when we met with our current group of foster parents, some foster parents were not too excited to hear about the new initiative and the new message. Um, and some of them chose to, you know, say, I, I just can't do that. And, but we had some foster parents who were already working with birth parents anyway and were having a lot of success. And then we had some foster parents who were on the line about, on the fence about it, and you know, said, well, we'll try it. Um, sometimes, every once in a while, you'll hear one case where there was a bad situation where the foster parent couldn't work with the birth parent. That, there's not that many cases. There are those cases out there, but for the most part, you have um, birth parents who need someone to coach or mentor them. Um, and, and showing them how to interact with their children, how to go to the school, how to go to the doctor's office, and um, advocate for the needs of your child. Some of the myths that we have come across when working with concurrent planning in the different counties and meeting with our stakeholders, when we went into the innovation zones, we tried to meet with CASA, we tried to meet with um, private providers who provided private foster homes, um, we also um, met with our, we tried to meet with the SAGs, the judges, um, 
anyone who was involved with that child's life or who would be potentially involved in a foster care case just to try to um, help them understand what concurrent planning was. And one of the myths that we often heard was concurrent planning is just a fast track to termination of parental rights and will set birth parents up for failure. Um, concurrent planning, like Julie said earlier, is um, it had, you have full disclosure and you're setting firm timelines with the parent that hold you as an agency accountable and the parent accountable. And in, when we were um, in, uh, trying to implement concurrent planning in the innovation zones, we had come up with a permanency orientation meeting where the, in the first few days, the case manager explains to a parent all the different options there are for um, permanency. There's adoption, and they would go into explaining what adoption was, what um, guardianship meant, what permanent custody with a relative meant, because sometimes we as an agency get so used to these permanency tracks that we forget it's like a foreign language to a parent. And sometimes you have to keep telling them that over and over and explaining to them. So the permanency orientation was to help parents realize what their options were. And also, it's not a fast track because the birth parent um, and the foster parent, we are encouraging them to work together in a concurrent plan. And even um, on regular, reunification cases with the partnership parents. Um, you know, concurrent planning is focused on permanency and the parents' rights, and we're focused on providing intensive reunification services. The next myth is that concurrent planning will cause case managers to give up on birth parents too quickly or to not sincerely work on reunification efforts. And the, um, Concurrent planning, again, requires that the case manager, the birth parent, the um, partnership parent, or the resource parent work together and that they're each accountable to each other. They're constantly meeting, trying to you know, see how we can uh, meet our time frames, how we can get these services in place so that the parent can be successful. And again, the case manager understands that in, in permanency planning, you have to have show reasonable efforts that you've captured or that you've tried to help reunify that child with the parent. The next myth is that concurrent planning just means having a backup plan. You don't actually have to do anything on the plan. Um, and again, the true concurrent planning model emphasizes that you cannot do sequential planning, that you mo must implement both plans at the same time. It's not just you know having a plan on paper, it's about actively working both plans. The next myth is you can do concurrent planning anytime during the life of a case. And concurrent planning requires you that you assess each case in the beginning to see if it needs a concurrent plan. And not every case will um, need a concurrent plan. And it also requires that if you choose a concurrent plan that you need to implement it within the first 90 days or three months. If you wait until the six to nine month period, then you're already reverted back to sequential planning. The next myth is when DFACS implements concurrent planning, every child in foster care will have a concurrent plan. And just working in those six innovation zones, it was a challenge to even work one or two concurrent plans. So if everyone was to go to concurrent planning in every case, um, I, I don't know how we could do it. It would have to be baby steps. Whenever you're implementing something this big, you have to start off small. And most states who have tried to implement concurrent planning have not been successful, and they usually revert back to sequential planning. Um, they often do not have enough resources. Concurrent planning is resource intensive. And the next myth is resource parents will sabotage the reunification efforts because they just want to adopt. And this speaks to recruitment. Again, often with DFACs, uh, we often recruit out of desperation. And our national resource consultant told us that. Y'all have got to stop recruiting out of desperation. And I love that because we we'll often say, well, if, they're just, if they'll just take this child, that, that's good. And it's not good enough for our children. We want foster care to be seen as a privilege to take care of these children who come to us 
who need a temporary placement. So when in your recruiting, it, it does take time to recruit the right partnership parents and resource parents. And you have to have clear expectations uh, about what to expect in a concurrent planning case. And you also have to provide support, which is a, a huge need for our current group of foster parents who deal with a variety of different children and needs. And then when you bring that concurrent planning element in there, you have to provide for that support. The case manager needs to know how to support that that resource parent. All right, turn it over to you guys. Okay. okay, we are going to talk about how you do all this work at the county level. So if you want to go ahead, Kristen, that's one. I'm going to share with you some staff challenges. First of all, every DFATS across the state, not just Paulding County, but it has affected Paulding County, has lost staff. Um, you know, we're on our fourth year of furlough days, uh, which are about to end, they tell me. Um, but it has caused a lot of staff turnover. With that, we've not been able to hire. So not only do I have staff turnover, I also have not enough numbers of case managers to handle the caseload. Um, and this slide is, is very cute. I, I made the mistake of sharing with uh, Judge Miller and Chris a story of a worker who left us and it became a slide. So I'm going to share that with you. Uh, we had a case manager who, when we interviewed, um, this is her heart. This is what she wants to do. She went to school for it. This is what she's going to do. She's here to stay. Uh, she went through about three months of training. She carried caseload for two months and she went to work for CarMax. <laughs> Um, making more money than she was making as a DFAX case manager and said, it's too hard, it's too stressful, I can't live like that. And this, I'm afraid, is, um, is the truth. Um, it's a very difficult job. Um, it, pro it certainly provides many challenges. Um, so with that in mind and looking at concurrent plans, which as you've heard all of the members say, it adds additional work to a case manager because you have to actively work both case plans at the same time. Um, was a challenge. And so in our county, we did the county assessment that's in your packet. Um, the administrator and myself did it. We looked at what we have, what we don't have, what we need, what's working, what's not working. So we came up with some changes in-house to maybe be able to start implementing concurrent planning the right way. And so one of the first things that we did on the next side as far as restructuring the agency um, we have implemented what we have called mirrored units. Now, those of you who are familiar with DFACS, you know we have Child Protective Services, which involves investigations, um, diversions, which is now called family support, and family preservation cases. Those cases are children are not in care. We are working with those children in their families, in their homes, hopefully to prevent them ever coming into care. The other unit, other side of social services is our permanency unit, which is our foster care cases, our adoption cases, our um, resource development, which is the people who recruit, train, and keep our foster parents current in their um, hours and approval process. So what we decided was in staff turnover, you attorneys out there know how many times you've been in court and say, the case manager says, I just got this case last week. They have known nothing about this child. They know nothing about the history. They know nothing about it. Well, this is a problem. And especially, it's a problem every day, but it's especially a problem if you're working a concurrent plan. So what we have done to try to solve this issue and to help us continue, our mirrored units, my, in CPS, we have, each, we have two units. Each unit has investigators, it ha which we're calling assessors because the same workers do investigations that do diversions. So they're called assessors. And we have family preservation workers. And those workers work with the families once we have confirmed that there is abuse or neglect in the home, not the severity that they need to be removed, but they need some services and some uh, in that home to help keep those children safe in the home. Those workers work with those families and providers and get services with the community and providers in the home so that the children can continue to remain at home. They're not in our custody. So one unit has we have two units. Each unit has each of those workers. 
And what happens is that supervisor now supervises all those programs in, in Child Protective Services. So when I have workers leave, the good part is I have a supervisor who knows that case. So we have the continuity of there's someone who knows this case and she can help bring the new worker who gets it along and up to speed so we don't lose any time in this child's life. Um, I've done the same with the foster care unit. Uh, we have two units. Each unit has foster care workers who deal with the children who first come into foster care and ongoing in foster care that they've been in care more than the first um, 48 days and they continue to be in care. And we also have each unit has a worker who will help specialize in termination parental rights um, and an adoption worker, all in the same unit. And so what happens, and I know attorneys in our courtroom have certainly had it and probably in every uh, defects across the state, is that not only do they say, I just got this case because I'm a new worker, sometimes they say, well, I'm the adoption worker and I just got the case, I didn't do the foster care. Well, that won't be true anymore because it'll stay in the same unit it will not be transferring from one unit to another, so we'll have the continuity. The workers are in the same unit together, they share the same supervisor, and they will have the knowledge of that case from beginning to end. Um, so hopefully that's going to keep the continuity and it's gonna have the case moving and we're not gonna add months to a child's life in foster care just because our staff changed. So that's the plan and we started this September 1st and in a few more months we'll have a clue how it's working. Um, and, and I, I said that the thing that kind of helped staff morale was that the supervisors this time were the ones who had to learn a new program, mm -hmm. not the case managers. So every supervisor I had had to learn a new program in their area. And it actually has revived the supervisors even. Um, they actually took to this very well and have been excited about it. It also helps me with the fact if I have a supervisor who's out an extended period of time, another supervisor knows all the programs they're covering. So hopefully it, it, was, it was too help us move concurrent planning, but I've got a lot of other benefits out of it also. So we'll let you know how that's going. Um, the next thing I wanna talk about as far as the new terminology of our foster homes, as Julie and Amy had shared, um, the county certainly has to, got to have some flexibility um, as we rename our foster parents. Um, when we looked at this, we looked in Paulding County we have 26 true foster homes. Now we have other foster homes, but their desires are adopt. Uh, they may be for a specific relative child, but we have 26 homes that are strictly just foster care homes. When we looked at those individually and assessed those with our resource development worker, we came up with six homes that we could actually relabel as a resource parent. Um, I mean, I'm sorry, as a partnership parent, so sorry. Um, because you've got to be very clear up front what the desire of that foster home is in order to be successful with partnership parents. Because you have got to have the parents who can work with these birth families with the goal of helping to get these children home. And not every foster home can do that. So it's very important that you know your home and you know the strengths of your home and that they're honest with themselves and honest with you. And so that's one uh, charge we have placed upon our resource development worker. So in relabeling our uh, foster homes to be partnership parents, um, the county's gonna have a little flexibility because these are homes who have children in them who may not fit a concurrent plan, but I'm not gonna replace a child um, just so I can meet a new label. I guess it's the, maybe not the politically correct way to say it, but that's what I'm gonna do. Um, so we're gonna do what's right for the children first but in the process, we will eventually have those homes, those six homes will be strictly partnership parents and those are the children that will go into those homes. And as far as resource parents, we have quite a few of those that can certainly work with the birth family, but will reserve the option if the child comes free because they've had them in their home, they begin to love them. And even if they didn't think they were wanting to adopt, sometimes they decide, but I love this child, he's part of our home now. And so those will classify more under the resource homes, but we will also work with those um, to make sure there's no sabotaging children and their birth parents because that's the number one priority. Um, we fortunately have a very strong resource development worker who's very honest and very upfront with our foster families and they know coming in that their goal is to work with this birth family. Um, and one of the things, we have to know our homes, but one of the things we have to do is know our cases. Uh, we've got to be aware from, from the beginning of day one of our case, is this a case that needs to be concurrent planning or not? 
So one of the things that we're, we're doing now in our challenges and in our revamping our units um, is we have um, incorporated new state policy with our staffing and we have hooked it on with our concurrent planning to get um, two birds with one stone. And I'm going to let Angie share about some of our new staffing um, things that we're doing. Um, one of the things that, that we talked about when we got together and we started talking about concurrent case planning and how are we going to have this, uh, clearly we're not going to get any more staff, clearly we have what we have, clearly we can't fix staff turnover, but w there are things that we can work on and fix. Um, one of the things that we talked about was the visitation center. Uh, we have a very um, aggressive visitation protocol because Judge Miller as well as uh, defects as well as attorneys as well as costs and guardian lines believe that children need to have more visitation with their parents um, and we don't have the staff clearly to ensure that three visits a week can happen between parents and children so we judge Miller and us <laughs> went out to the community and said how can y'all help us um, this is what we need these are our children how can we fix this so we now have in our county uh, a visitation center. Now it has had its pros and cons um, and, and it's been a challenge to get that up and running. We have some really great people who's worked on this and, and they've done a great job but it, it's the nature of the beast. Um, one of the things that we realized was is that the, um, the pros obviously is that we could incorporate more visitation, that we could accommodate those schedules. The majority of our kids have it on average three visits a week with their parents, which is unheard of. Um, the con to that was is what we had noticed was is that caseworkers were losing contact with their families. They were not there because we have uh, volunteers who supervise those visits. They were not there and not seeing the interaction between the kids and the parents. And because of that, um, you know, we started losing some of that observation that's really important in order to determine when concurrent case planning needs to occur, when that change needs to happen. So one of the things that we took back to the county to try to fix this is, is we've now asked that our caseworkers observe at least one visit per month with their family and children. Um, so we're hoping that as we move forward with that, that the, the issue with the visitation center, that, that issue will, will be fixed. Another thing that we looked at was, is on the reunification side, when the biggest complaint that we had with parents was is you give me a resource list, you give me a case plan, and you want me to go to 12 different providers to do 12 different things and they all coincide with each other and they're all so expensive and I don't have the resources for that. So we sat down as a community and talked to one of our providers and said, okay, how can we fix this? This is our problem, how can we fix it? So we had family intervention specialists for our community step up to the plate and say, okay, this is what we'll do. We'll be your front door. We will do as many of the services as we can here at our agency so that we can cut down on some of that chaos for parents. And Judge Miller got it for free. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, but that's been a huge, huge factor with uh, concurrent planning because if you're offering a parent, if you're knocking those barriers down where you're offering them a package to say, here, this is your plan, do it. Let's see how you can do it. We'll encourage you to do it, but we've taken the, the excuses away. If those parents don't jump on that right away, and if you're looking at three, four months down the road and it's not happened, then you know you've got a good case for a concurrent planning because the likelihood of this parent reaching the finish line timely for, for these children to be reunified is, is very slim. So those are some of the things that... Um, that yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, those are some of the things that, that we've got, and I'll let Barbara talk a little bit about our, our data system. Yeah, this is Chris's favorite slide, in case you did not know that. Um, um, you can read the cartoon, I tried to warn him, garbage in, garbage out. Our system is just as good as the information that's put into it. The information that's put into it has to come from our caseworkers and a good bit from our supervisors. Um, I have very little I have to put in shines, fortunately. Um, but one of the things, this system was set up to help us with our tracking. And this is, I have 28, almost 29 years with DFAS, and this is the best tracking system 
the first system that we've actually had where you can track something. Um, like I said, it has its limits because it's really only as good as the information that's put into it. The slides that Judge Miller showed earlier, we all know are not 100% accurate, but it depends on how timely information gets in and when the reports are pulled, how accurate those numbers are. So for us locally, we still keep track of having an idea of, of our numbers so that when we pull it, we know what's missing in shines. Because sometimes we have to go back with a worker or a supervisor to say, so and so's not showing, we need to look and see why that's not showing up. Um, and this is a system that they're still adding to uh, as money appears, <laughs> or they find, or move around, or whatever the word is. Um, they're implementing and adding some um, updates to our system. So it's getting better every day, but there are still some kinks we're working out. And as case managers, we're not computer people. Um, so it's been, a, it's been a learning curve for us all. So hopefully we're getting better with that. We've had it since 08 and we're getting a little better um, than in the beginning. And of course our young case workers are just breezes at it. It's those of us who've been around a while who have to really practice. Um, but the bottom line is that this is a new tracking system for us and we actually have a way to track cases now. We can pull reports. Um, I can go in um, as a county director, I can go in under every supervisor. I can see their staffings, what they've entered, what's not been entered. I can tell where they are today. I can pull up a report every morning to see how many children we have in care, how many we've seen this month, how many we haven't. Again, that's based on documentation being entered in the system. So sometimes when I freak out and run it down the hall and say, we've only seen 12% of our kids this month, well, actually, we've seen 82%, but the workers have got to get in their office and document. So, but it is a good tracking system, but it's only as good as the information that's put into it, like every system that's out there. Um, but that's what our Shines is. And with that, um, the supervisors now are, are doing some um, really in-depth intel um, staffings. Um, and just going to be back up. Okay. Um, one of the, another thing that we implemented uh, in our, well, it's region-wide actually, is um, every child, every month, every staffing. We staff every child every month. And with that, we now have a tracking system that's in place for when we have developed tasks that workers need to do to ensure that they're doing the work for concurrent planning. Um, we are now tracking those to ensure that, that those items are getting done so that permanency can be achieved for, um, for children. But one of the interesting things that I found um, in talking about this concurrent planning and, and trying to figure out where the, the caseworkers were is that a lot of the caseworkers were doing concurrent planning work but didn't know the language. They didn't know when Judge Miller asked them, well, what are you doing about the adoption piece um, on your case plan? They didn't know that simply talking about that to a foster parent to see if they were willing to be an adoptive resource or talking to a therapist about are you, is this child ready for adoption? Can you start working on that process with them? They didn't realize that that's what we were asking. It was like a foreign language in court, but when I sit down one-on-one -on -one and start talking about it and actually start asking the questions without putting the terminology there, it's like I'm getting this great feedback. So. I found that to be, to be very interesting and it certainly was giving me an opportunity to know how to better educate in staffings the workers to know how to further on what they're already doing but also how to present that in court and also to present that to parents and to um, foster parents. Another thing I learned was is you know when you have new workers it's really easy for them to know how to do A, B, and C. You get a child in care, you get them in a placement, you do the shine stuff, you do the paperwork, you, you know, make sure you staff the case. But I don't think that they ever really, that's as far as their knowledge went. Because without that seasoned worker who's ever worked a case from beginning to end, they don't understand that everything we do from the beginning has an impact on the end. And that's actually what brought up the, the slide here is, is um, I don't know if any of you has ever played billiards or pool, but you know, the old saying is, is that if you play pool and you can think two shots ahead, then you're a good pool player. But if you can think three shots ahead, you're a great pool player. And that's kind of where I have to get my staff, is try to teach them how to be those three shots ahead thinkers so that concurrent case plan works and permanency happens sooner for these kids.
All right, guys, I think that just about wraps up what we had to, um, to say to you. And for those of you where we did not have information on um, the handouts, if you'll go on to the um, website for the uh, DFAX concurrent planning resources, the website's listed right there. You can find the parent participation handbook and um, some of the, I think, like, if you look around in the appendix, it's like page 33, 34, 35, that sort of thing. There, uh, it's all in there, and you can, um, there's a ton of information out on the World Wide Web for you um, regarding concurrent planning. So thank you for allowing us to come. And now we're going to open it up for questions. So question. Oh, yeah, if you'll bring them up here. OK. This actually isn't a question. I just wanted to make sure that everybody knew that there are also 20 CASAs in the state of Georgia who have been trained as permanency counselors. We were talking about that earlier. So if you need to use one of them, either contact the Committee on Justice for Children or you can contact um, Jen King at the state CASA office. Thank you. Questions or other comments? Margaret. Uh, <laughs> oh, okay. So I guess um, my question is about the foster parents, about the difference between the two kinds. The partnership and the resource. Is the partnership parents and the resource parents. So is resource parents what we used to think of as the foster to adopt? Um, no. OK. The partnership parent is a regular foster home. The resource parent is the concurrent planning home. They are doing away with the foster to adopt terminology. Is every foster parent a foster to adopt almost? No. You I mean, have, I know we have some that don't. You have, a, an, a, you have a category of adoptive parents, resource parents, and partnership parents. Um, the resource parent takes the child with the understanding that they will try to help the birth parent be reunified with the child, but if they are not, they will adopt that child. The um, foster to adopt terminology was done away with just because down through the years it's kind of had a bad history of um, it, if they don't get the, you know, we hope the birth parent doesn't get their child back so you can adopt. So there's a, there's a lot of bad histories associated with that terminology and we don't want to go back to that way of thinking. So that's why we have different categories. But you can, I mean, if you're a partnership parent, you can revert, um, revert to a resource parent, or you can potentially adopt, but there's, we don't want that um, old terminology being used. And um, I think I had another question maybe for Judge Miller about, I don't want to be hogging all the questions, but um, so on the timelines, I was curious to see how much of the delay where we're seeing that 12-month delay do you think that is in kids getting to court for their adoptions? You know, like, is it a court-based problem, or is it that we're, that's the problem we're ha having getting them a court date? You mean after um, they've, they've um, been, or during the time they're working concurrent? Barbara needs to answer this one. I think I can answer this, Margaret. <laughs> it's not a court delay. Um, In-house process is at, at, we staff, the workers, and the supervisor administrator has to staff with me, the county director, at the point that they want to move a child to TPR. And we staff at five months and at nine months. Um, and I have a recently had a five month case that I felt was ready for TPR and had agreed on it. The delay's not, once, once I've signed off on it and it's given to the SAC to file, he has 30 days to file, we have court dates set up immediately. It may be a couple of months down because in our system we do one week a month. So we may be booked for a couple of months out, and it may be a few months down. But that 12-month delay is really the way we've been working in-house as far as trying to work 12 months reunification and then start the next process. So that's where the delay is. Well, and I guess my question then is, so is it that the adoption lag is from termination to adoption? From termination to adoption. That's what I thought. If there's an appeal. Lag. Um, we've have had several cases with appeals and that we've had some cases tied up two years in appeals mm -hmm. before we could process with finalization. 
And the other thing is after, after a TPR, even if it's not appealed, then the adoption process is handled in the Superior Court and not in the Juvenile Court, so we don't have, in Paulding County, we don't have um, any control over that. And, it, and there are, after TPR, there has been months sometimes getting into the Superior Court because other things come before um, those cases in Superior Court. And I, I don't know if we um, emphasize this to a tenant of concurrent planning is making sure that um, that very first placement you're placing in a resource uh, parent home so that there's not um, a delay in getting a child to a home that is willing to adopt that you know if it's a um, a family that just wants to uh, be foster parents to a child um, we you know we want them to just be with the foster kids who don't have concurrent plans so that's another that can cause a delay as well other questions? Yes, ma'am. Can you make some recommendations of best practices for parent attorneys in the concurrent planning context? Hmm. Okay, well, I think you, you have to be open to the, the new philosophy and you have to be upfront with your clients that um, mm -hmm. foster care is a short term temporary placement do what you can as quickly as you can, or DFAX is gonna move ahead with permanent plans for the child. Mm -hmm. And that's about as, and I have been known to be blunt, that's about as blunt as you can put it. You know, get on the ball. And one of the things that I try to say when we're doing the case plan reviews, um, and I try to use tough love, but you know, come on, we're waiting on you. Mama, daddy, we are waiting on you. This little baby doesn't need to be in foster care get your act together and sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't I would like to say another thing that I think is important is most of us in here if you have children you know if something happens to you what where your child would go sometimes our parents that we work with they've not thought about that or they they've not really processed that and as a parent's attorney when you're talking about concurrent planning you can say you know, we want the child to go back with you, but if, if they couldn't go back with you, where would you want that child to be? And that is something really important for them to start processing and thinking about, even if the child is coming back to them. And when you're talking to your client about, you know, the DFAX office is gonna um, actually ask you to sit down and make a list of relatives, mm -hmm. don't name everybody in the family mm -hmm. because everybody's not appropriate. Some of them are dead. <laughs> so you really ought not to put them on the list but um you know sit down and talk to them who do you really want to take this child if you can't be there who do you really want to take this child and who wants your child i can't i had a list of diligent search cases the other day we were looking at it 10 or 12 uh, relatives names first one does not want the child does not want the child cannot take the child does not want the child dead um possible yeah you know, the next one was possible you know don't yeah in jail mm -hmm. yeah don't don't just give us numbers give us quality give us quality of folks that would really take your child and love your child like you like you'd want them to and i would also you know recommend open and honest conversations with the case manager about what's going on with the situation i mean we're required to provide intensive reunification services and and sometimes we can't if we don't know what all is going on mm -hmm. in that particular mm -hmm. situation and also to add with the diligent search piece um, you know we need to know who who the dad is and if he's a potential resource and the paternal relatives as well one of the things also on the diligent search i had a case the other day and um case manager says you know the typical i'm new well, you know, I'm sorry, but in my courtroom, that doesn't get them very far. And um, I'm new. I don't really care whether you're new. I don't care if you started this morning. If you're here in court and you're representing the department, you better know your case. And so she was telling me that the diligent search was done by the case manager before her. I thought, well, great. So you have no interest in this. You have no obligation to continue a diligent search? Uh-uh. You go back to the office and have your diligent search updated by, before you come back to see me. And they come every three months. We, we, we go through this every three months. We talk about these cases, how the parents doing, how the children are doing, 
every three months. It's no surprise when we get to termination at nine months, at 12 months. No one is surprised. Um, this question is for the folks from the state office. Um, I know that the law now requires that when a diligent search is done, the department is also required by law to send notice out to everybody identified in that search who has a relationship with the child um, uh, that the child is coming into foster care and what the, what the person could do and that they'll lose the opportunity uh, to be a placement for the child if they don't respond and how to become a foster parent and the financial incentives for doing so or the, what, what they may you know, be able to get to, to assist. I shouldn't say incentives, but assistance to do so. Is that being done anywhere in the state? <laughs> Paulin, tell them about it. It's done in Paulin County, I can assure you. <laughs> um, Judge Miller certainly holds um, our agency accountable. Um, and, you know, I, I jokingly sometimes say that being a defense worker is hard, but being a defense worker for Judge Miller is even harder. Um, <laughs> my workers work very much, but it assures quality. Mm -hmm. And our, our children and our families are receiving services that you're not necessarily receiving throughout the state, but it's because of her expectation and her requirements of us. Um, but we move children. You know, foster care is not right for any child. Every child deserves more than foster care. Um, and so they're not going to grow old in foster care, and especially not in Paulding County. And let me just say that, um, you know, we, I started looking up this concurrent thing back in July, and you heard them say in September they took the – I didn't tell them to do anything with concurrent. I just asked a couple of questions, and lo and behold, the next thing I know, September 1, they've revamped their whole agency to, in order to address concurrent planning. So they get it. They are thinking those um, three shots ahead always. So I'm um, very proud of the case managers and the, the agency in Paulding County. The, the practice varies from county to county. Everybody wishes they had a Judge Miller in their yeah. county. And one but, thing, yeah. I'm sorry, but one thing I could say to the question about the parent attorneys, sometimes what happens is we're not given good list. Mm -hmm. We don't, we sometimes have a name with no address and, and we use accurate search all the time in mm -hmm. Paulding County. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes it, it's hard to find, you know, 1500 John Smith, which one's the right John Smith, mm -hmm. if we don't have an address. So sometimes it's very difficult to get the letter in the right hand because of the information that we're given from the family. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> have y'all considered copying the parents' attorneys on those letters? It might help us to we'd be one more person that can talk to the parent about the list and who's included and that kind of stuff. I don't, I've never seen that letter. And you know you probably haven't because someone hasn't said we have to do it, but that is a great idea and certainly can be done easily. Mm -hmm. Consider it done. Consider it done. In Paulding. In Paulding, Karen, <laughs> consider it done. All right, anything else, guys? Yes, I'm way over here, hold on for the mic. CASA volunteer and um, I'm getting the pushback that it's too much work concurrent. Is there something that I can do to help to maybe make that happen? Actually, um, that's a critical piece is when you're trying to implement concurrent planning in each county is to meet with your stakeholders and CASA being one of those. And someone has mentioned in the past in their in one of the innovation zones of utilizing CASA maybe to help um, with the visits between the birth parent and the child. There's, it really needs to, the county needs to sit down with CASA to tell them what their needs are because each county is different. Right. So yeah, they would be very appreciative to come to the table with CASA to see okay. how CASA can help with that. I, I mean, we all understand how busy everybody is but it's not fair to my cases, to my children. One of the things that you might want to do is get online and get the copies of the resource, um, the, the guides, the handbooks, and then it really has to be a community, like she said, stakeholders coming together, sitting down at the table, saying, you know, this is the process, where can we start? Because there are a lot of things that the department has to go through to figure out where they are in the process. How can we implement it? So. And there is an assessment tool or a guide that we um, provide for counties that kind of tells them, you know, the things they're going to need. And um, I believe Barbara referred to it earlier. Um, so it kind of gives some guidance. And 
Um, Amy and myself, we have uh, a couple of other folks who are available for technical assistance and help. That's what we've, Judge Miller has um, volunteered us, voluntold us for. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we'd, we'd be happy to, to help with that. All right, more questions? Please join me one last time in thanking all of Thank you. Thank you.